1999 to raise awareness about the importance of Africa's industrialization and the challenges faced by the continent. Every time it's 5 p.m. on Hard Facts, it means that from 5 until 6, we're having conversations about one big issue in Nigeria today. And today, we're discussing Nigeria's path to industrialization. Like I said, it's Africa Industrialization Day. Now, the theme for this year's Africa Industrialization Day is positioning African industry to supply the African Continental Free Trade Agreement market. The goal is to raise awareness about the challenges and opportunities for Africa's industrialization within the framework of the brand new AFCFTA. So as we discuss industrialization in Nigeria, we'll take some time to look at it in the context of the AFCFTA, which we've agreed to join. Now, I'm not going to go forward without telling you today's big hard fact. According to the Central Bank and Trading Economics, Nigeria's industrial output is currently minus 10.5 index point, the lowest since the first quarter of 2016 when it hit minus 20.4. So Nigeria's industrial output is at one of its lowest points in recent history. And we're going to be talking about why that is the case, what can be done to change it, and whether or not the AFCFTA will be helpful or harmful to the mission. Now, we cannot talk uh, industrialization without talking steel and electricity. Steel is the raw material uh, for industry, and electricity powers it. So we've brought you two experts on those topics. My first guest literally wrote the book on industrialization. He's the author of From Consumption Production the why, from consumption to production, the whys and ways out of a failed industrialization in Nigeria. He's Professor Banji Oyelero Oyeyinka. Welcome back to Hard Facts, Prop. Thank you, Sandra. And my, to yes. And my second guest is a legal practitioner. He's an energy specialist and a public administrator. His career includes service at the Bureau for Public Enterprise, the Power Sector Reform Team, and as a commissioner of the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. He is Eyo Ekwo. Welcome to Hard Facts, sir. Hello, Sandra, and my greetings to all your listeners. Now, as usual, you who's my listener is my most important guest. So throughout the show, I want to take your calls. Do you work in the industrial sector? Do you work in manufacturing, in utilities, in mining? What are some of the issues that you face in your work? We'd like you to give us your first-hand knowledge of the sector. But even if you don't work in the sector, I want your input as well. What does Nigeria need to do to become an industrialized nation? And what are the obstacles to doing them? Now, let's start with a bird's-eye view. In Nigeria's march towards industrialization... Are we on track or off track, Professor? Thank you very much. Uh, um, mm, how to answer this question? <laughs> uh, obviously, uh, <laughs> obviously, we started well in the uh, 70s uh, up until the mid-80s. And uh, after the structural adjustment program, uh, Nigeria got completely... Uh, off track with industrialization. Uh, the fact that uh, the GDP contribution from manufacturing to, to overall GDP is uh, less than 10%, and it has remained so almost all these 30 years or so, uh, is enough to convince you that um, we haven't done very well. Uh, usually, a country on a path of structural transformation will move from agriculture to industry and then to services. Uh, we haven't progressed very much. Neither ha we haven't had a green revolution to change the structure of the agricultural sector. Neither have we had a, a real industrial revolution. And um, right now we have the fourth industrial revolution upon us. Uh, we have a lot of catching up to do uh, for the simple reason that we failed to put in place the foundational sectors like iron and steel, like the chemical sector, like the fertilizers, uh, uh, machine tools industry, 
all of those uh, metallics and chemicals are necessary prerequisites for industrialization. So it's not a surprise uh, mm. that by all measures, we uh, we have actually not been uh, on track. Mr. Ekbo, I wonder if you agree with uh, Professor Yeyinka. Do you think that we are on track or off track? Well, you know, okay, so... If, if I didn't speak like a lawyer, I'm sure your your listeners would, would be wondering whether I would be the lawyer. <laughs> I, I I would I would I, I would um, try to just change the language a little bit. Okay. Um, I don't think it's been off track or on track. We have been on track. The question is how quickly have we moved? For me, anyway. Mm. Um, I agree entirely with everything that the, the good professor has said, mm. um, I would just simply conclude that we simply have not moved as quickly as we should have along the road on which we set ourselves. In the decade, in 25 years rather, I would say between 1975 and the year 2000, mm. when our population, our demographics changed, um, you might even say dramatically, and, and our population numbers mm. um, exploded. We should have had um, a similar quantum increase Mm. in what the professor has described as the foundations of industrialization. Mm. And we did establish those factories. We remember the Nigerian machine tools. We remember our petrochemical businesses that we set up. We remember the infrastructure that we tried to lay in the second and third national development plans mm. of the 70s and the 80s. We just simply did not follow through. Um, for whatever reason, I don't think we're going to discuss why today mm. in terms of the, 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 the macroeconomic side of it, the, 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 the governmental side of it. But we just simply did not follow through along the road and we, 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 we establish ourselves. So somewhere along the line, we allowed uh, our fledgling iron and steel um, um, industry to fall by the wayside, our machine tools to fall by the wayside. Mm. Um, the, the, the basic industries in, in, in oil and gas, um, element petrochemicals, for instance, we, we, are, we, we set them up, but we, we simply did not follow through on them. Our LNG plants um, are... are, are Agricultural uh, agribusiness, mm. uh, trying to add value to agribusiness with, mm. in terms of our plantations, our oil palm um, plantations, our iron and steel mining companies. Mm -hmm. We just simply let them go to waste. And so we have slowed ourselves down significantly as our population numbers increased, uh, went in the opposite direction. The growth that should have happened just did not happen. Mm. And worst of all, I think you probably also, uh, <laughs> being somebody from the power sector, what we should have done with the power sector mm -hmm. um, and geometrically grew our, 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 our electricity industry, mm. we just simply did not. So all those basics, um, uh, we, we started them mm -hmm. in the right way in the early 70s. I would say that our founding fathers actually saw the way and, mm -hmm. and tried to set Nigeria along that way in, mm -hmm. the, in the 60s and mm -hmm. the early 70s. Mm -hmm. Somewhere, sometime after 75, we just simply lost our way and we Rather than progress along the track, we've, we've, we've retrogressed. I, I really don't think that we are off the track. Off the track. Because today, mm -hmm. um, you, you see that there is an effort, albeit um, sometimes not joined up, sometimes uncertain. Mm -hmm. There's an effort to try and put us back on that road with, mm -hmm. with mixed results. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it really hasn't happened. And, and I think it's because when, when we should have started and just continued mm. to grow, mm. we held ourselves back for, okay. for, for various reasons. Okay. Now, uh, I have to mention, of course, that my guests are joining this conversation from different parts of the world. <laughs> so we've got uh, Mr. Igbo joining us from Abuja and Professor Yeyinka joining us from Addis Ababa. Now, I have to ask you, Professor, why does it matter? Why is industri industrialization important anyway? Thank you very much. Let me let me make a bit of clarification. Okay. Uh, industrialization all through history has been the the major strategy by which every country had uh, made progress. Uh, you hear epochal uh, divisions like first industrial revolution, second, third, and now we're in the fourth. Mm. Uh, Britain got its break uh, on the path to becoming an advanced industrial country. Because, precisely because of its industrialized. Uh, industrialization is the application of those uh, very uh, innovative tools. For example, uh, you know, we started with steam engine, there was electricity, that led to the factory system. The, the, the what we call the network, uh, the network system of electricity was actually 
what enabled factories to be what factories are. In other words, we are now able to connect different areas of production, uh, so you have a continuous system of production and so forth. Mm. Uh, without that, you won't have instant iron and steel industry, chemical industry, all of which are linked in a chain of production processes. Mm. So basically, uh, industrialization has been that strategy or the, the, the what you might call the origin of modernization. Uh, and all nations, no matter where you look at today, uh, that is one single tool uh, by which nations have modernized from, if you look at agriculture, for instance, uh, countries that had mastered the industrial arts have been able to modernize their agriculture. In other words, they have industrialized agriculture, you know, uh, using, you know, machine power, where manpower was key. For example, we are still using hoes and cutlasses in some villages. Uh, people started now uh, using animal power, then they began to use tractors, harvesters, combined harvesters, mm. uh, mechanical devices, to the point where uh, a country like uh, Brazil today cultivates only about 7.8% of its land mm. and feeds about 1.2 uh, billion people. Uh, in the United States, the number of people who are on the farms are less than 1%, but you find that in most African countries, uh, Seventy percent of people are, of, are, are involved in agriculture. Yet they can't even feed themselves. Mm. Africa has an uh, import bill of food thirty-five billion dollars. Why? That is the difference between those who modernize and use mechanical, mechatronics, electronic systems mm -hmm. to those who are still labor-intensive uh, societies. So that's the difference, you know. And I, I'm saying this so I, I want to make a distinction because people say, oh, now we have fourth industrial revolution, so move away from the farms. No. Mm. What you want to say is modernize agriculture. I see. Industrialize agriculture. Oh. You see, you use the same tools that you use, for example, in machine tools and all that. You apply it to every sector. And then you begin to read, see high productivity generated across all sectors. Okay. You know, now, you find, I, for example, countries that are very advanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go, yes. Uh, I I want no, to. I was no, just going to and and um, and say something mm. here. Your question, Sandra, was mm. about why is it important? Yes. Um, and for me, it's, it's quite simple. Um, in the late 18th century, a chap, an Englishman called Malthus, Thomas Malthus, proposed or propounded a theory mm -hmm. that the rate of population growth. It's called the Malthusian theory would outstrip the ability of agriculture to feed the population. And therefore, at some point in time, diminishing returns would set and would kind of begin to self-destruct, right? And that seemed to be the case until industrialization happened. And as the professor has pointed out, then changed exponentially the, the, the many things, standards of living, rates of production, manner of production, what it is we produce and thereby enabled population growth to be, to, 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 or rather, the rate of production um, of mankind, of various goods and services, to then keep up and even outstrip population growth mm -hmm. in such a way that we could go to new places and settle, extend um, urbanization, create new concepts, new standards of living. So essentially, why industrialization is important is that it enables communities mm -hmm to regenerate and to grow. And as the professor has pointed out with the statistics that he has reeled out, and they're, co and they're correct, mm. in other parts of the developed world, a very small number of people in the agricultural uh, sector, but they produce, they far, they produce what, they, what they produce far outstrips their number, both in, in terms of value and, um, to themselves as people and to the, and to the population and the economy as a whole. Mm. Whereas in Africa, many of us are engaged rather unproductively um, in, 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 in agriculture, in terms of the quality of what we, of, of what we produce, the, the manner in which we add value to, to what it is we produce, mm. and our ability to produce per capita, both in terms of land employed and people employed. And the only difference between us and them out there 
its industrialization. Hmm. Now, uh, we would all agree that there are two major material requirements for industrialization, power and steel. I want us to talk about power for a bit, and I, I have a power expert on the show, so I will start with you. Electricity. We use uh, 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 um, electricity, right? As household consumers, we already know that we do not have enough power. How come the industrial sector is also not getting enough power? Are they not prioritized, Mr. Ebo? You know, um, there's, there's a myth that Nigeria doesn't have enough power. And, and I'm trying to choose my words here very carefully. Hmm. When we say we don't have enough electricity, the kind of electricity we're talking about is what I might describe as publicly available electricity. In other words, electricity that is supplied to us by entities set up and run specifically to provide us with electricity. All right? Okay. We don't have enough of that. But on the other hand, Sandra, I, I don't know you, I haven't met you physically, mm -hmm. but I'm almost certain that you either own or you live in an estate that has authentic power supply. Right? Okay. Um, your your your, your radio station has a backup generator, has several which backup is not generators. a backup, but is actually the main source of electricity. Yes. So when you take all that together, we actually have electricity in the country. I would say, back <laughs> of the envelope um, assumptions, we all, um, you, me, the various industries, all have power supply uh, platforms, if I may use that, that word or that phrase, mm. that delivers to us, I would say, maybe like, something between 60 and 70,000 uh, uh, megawatts a day, hmm. um, which is something like 15, 16 times what is publicly available. The problem is that to deliver that electricity to ourselves, we probably spend something in the order of magnitude of about, I would say, 2 to 3 billion a day in terms of diesel. You just gave us a, a lawyer's answer to that question. No, it's, it's not a lawyer's answer. I'm trying to explain to you why we have this challenge. Okay. So money that we should be spending or investing, all right, mm -hmm. in industry, in growing our businesses, in the future of our children, in investing for our families, mm -hmm. we spend on providing power to us at a very expensive and inefficient cost to the economy. So if you think about it, our economy is not able to invest, I don't know, one to two, 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 two trillion every year that we should be investing in more productive means for our economy. That, to me, um, given what I've seen over the last 17 years in the electricity sector, mm -hmm. is one of the key reasons why our economy is rather unproductive and inefficient. We are spending on the wrong things. We shouldn't be providing our own electricity to ourselves. We shouldn't be our own, to use a phrase that we, a word that we all know, we shouldn't be our own NEPA, so to speak. We should, uh, we should have NEPAs working for us, which are the electricity distribution companies, but they are not. And so um, I would say that's, that, that, that is the fundamental reason why. Why that has happened over the years, um, again, has been, if I'm in, in one or two sentences, we have had successive governments in this country that seem to think that electricity is a social welfare um, issue and, and not a means of production that is itself the product of a manufacturing process. You have to, you have to, you, you need input to go into delivering one single unit of electricity to all of us. In other countries that are productive, um, anywhere in the world, electricity is a commodity that is bought and sold. All right, in mm. order for it to continue growing, the stock of supply to continue. So growing. I guess we're walking Rather, we're yeah, walking into we into the place where all of the power experts I've ever had on the show will say to you that the tariffs for the Jenkos and the discos no, are too low. No, it's it's not it's not about tariffs being low. I remember on my blog I once wrote a paper, uh, I once posted something on, on my paper about tariffs. It's not about them being too low. It's about them not being set right. Okay. I wonder what Professor right? Yenka has it's, to it's, say about the points that you've raised so far. Prof? Yeah? What do you have to say about the points that uh, Mr. Ebo has raised so far? 
Sorry, uh, it was a bit uh, muffled. Uh, you mean on electricity, right? Yes, electricity. Oh, no. I mean, the simple answer for me is that you cannot industrialize without electricity. You know, the what we have in Nigeria is an anomaly. It's a very strange uh, situation we find ourselves that we have not been able to deal with this issue. Uh, and I don't, I'm not really, I don't think it's helpful for us to, I'm sure uh, the colleague who is speaking probably is more involved in the politics of it. But the simple answer is that one of the major setbacks for our industrial progress mm. is uh, lack of electricity. Uh, if you don't have that, you can't run factories. If you don't run factories, you can't generate jobs. If you cannot generate jobs, people will go and join the Mediterranean. It's as simple as that. Uh, you know, the difference between uh, having enclave economies like oil, you know, and I call it, I uh, note that word, enclave economy, because they are so localized mm. and they require highly specialized skills. But when you industrialize, you create uh, all of these small, medium enterprises, micro are able to get involved in the value chain of supplies. Hmm. Uh, take, for example, you want to build a house. You need cement, you need paint, you need uh, iron, you need uh, wires, you need electricity uh, connections, you need uh, telecom. So which means you just take a single house. See what enters into It's a whole network. Imagine a city, for example. Hmm. Imagine the number of uh, industrial products that goes into that house pipings uh wiring uh you have to do water sanitation all of these are products of the industrial age mm. and all of them require electricity at the heart of everything i mean electricity is a product of the second industrial revolution <laughs> since the 1800 mm. so and we're still struggling so it's really for me an anomaly Mm. So the simple thing is that we need to fix it. We need to, you know, if you have, if I, you know, if you have the opportunity to be at the, 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 the have the power, this is an emergency. It should be an emergency. Mm. And uh, anyone who is involved in sabotaging the election in Nigeria should go to jail somewhere, you know. So it's, it's as simple as that. You come to where I live now in Cote d'Ivoire, in Abidjan. Do you believe that there small, are people? It's a small country. Do you believe that there are people sabotaging uh, uh, our electricity in Nigeria? Well, Sandra, you know, I'm not a um, lawyer. I, I, I would, I would know, say, I would say, yes. no, Mr. Ebo, I'll, I'll lawyer, come, I'll I'll come back to you, okay. Mr. Ebo. Hold on, uh, Prof. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not a lawyer, but it, it does. Does it look normal to you? <laughs> that a country like this cannot fix electricity? Does it look normal to you that if South Africa produces over 20 megawatt, 20,000 megawatt, does it look normal that I live in a small country called Cote d'Ivoire here in Abidjan? I don't experience electricity shortage. It's not normal. So even, I don't know whether it's the active sabotage or implicit sabotage, whether it's just what people call corruption. Mm. Obviously, there's something wrong. We are, we are, you know, we really have an issue. Uh, I mean, we hear $16 billion spent during one regime. Mm. We don't see anything. You know, and we, we, all of us just got used to this anomaly. So, but my point is, we just need to fix this. Okay. By all means, we need to fix this. Okay. That's, that's just my message. Now, let's talk about steel, yeah. Prof. You were on the show a couple of weeks ago to discuss the problems with the Ajokuta Steel Complex, right? Now, uh, we also took yes. it a bit further. We talked about the current state of our steel industry, how the steel plants are faring. And we talked about the one in Delta work doing uh, better than uh, Ajokuta could ever do. I want to talk about a a, a an agreement that the president has entered with Vladimir Putin of Russia. He's entered a government-to-government -government agreement to finish the Ajokuta steel complex. They will provide us with loans to fund the project and also provide the technical capacity for the project. What do you think about this move? Some have said Ajokuta is a white elephant, and I think you, you were probably one of those who said that uh, and should be left alone. Uh, I, I'm wondering what you think about this particular move. Well, I'm not, uh, like I said, I'm not privy to the, any signature, uh, you know, I'm not privy to that particular 
uh, ins- uh, uh, event mm. in Moscow. Um, I'm, I'm also aware that in our country, you know, the, those are the highest level of uh, leadership. Normally, don't get access to the best kinds of information. This is the truth. I was in that system for many years. Uh, many in time, you have too much vested interest. So when you see something like this, you read in the papers, you are very cautious. You you really, you know, we've seen this so many times. I mean, you live in a, you've seen so many regimes come. Oh, we have signed something with somebody. They're going to do this. They're going to, you know. And as I said to you the last time, in a Yoruba proverb says that if you spend 10 years getting ready to be a mad person, he said, you know, you, 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 Threatening people, I'm going to be mad, I'm going to be mad. Ten years, you haven't gotten mad. How many years will you be mad, actually? <laughs> you know, this is the irony of it. This is the irony. Mm. You know, we started this thing. I was part of it in 1979. Forty years ago, I was one of the trainees to India. And then we come back. We were so excited. We're building. We started this journey with Korean steel plants. Today, that plant is producing close to 60,000 uh uh, 60 million tons a year. You know, the revenue for that company is, uh, is, is just mind-boggling. And here we are still talking of getting a, st- a plant off the ground, something that was started 40 years ago. Seriously. You know, if you park your car for 40 years and then someone comes, oh, let me fix the car, it's going to start running like a new one. Are you going to believe it? I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, you know, like I told you, I don't have faith in uh, someone saying something that is totally bastardized they have uh, you know more or less uh, you know a lot of things we hear i haven't been back there for many years so i really don't know i think it should there should be serious study uh, oversighted by non uh, interested parties although that's difficult to find these days mm. everybody gets to that point they get corrupted that's the problem okay you now l- let's so, move it along let's like said, you know, the leadership yeah, they need to get serious, serious. information that is devoid of uh, Western interests. Yeah. Okay, uh, Mr. Ebo, the the AFC uh, AFCFTA. Let's talk about that. Yes, the UN says <coughs> industrialization will work best for African nations if they have good markets within Africa, within Africa, for their products, because it would make them less vulnerable to economic problems in other continents. Now, interestingly, uh, the professor has been on several panels today alone talking about uh, Africa industrialization uh, 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 day as well as the AFCFTA. But I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Mr. Ebo. How realistic is it to plan for a market in Africa for our future industrial output? Um, as, as, I, I see the AFCTA as um, for the first time, Africa being clear about its intentions. There's still a distance to go between our intentions and the actualization of those intentions. Okay. And it, it all boils down to the sinews of trade, all right? Mm-hmm. Infrastructure, one. Physical infrastructure. Okay. Our roads, our rail, our power supply across the continent. That's one. Two. Mm-hmm. The financial flows that fund and enable trade are not that clear cut or deepened within our continent. Okay. That's that second. Third, the protocols um, that will actualize the free trade agreement itself okay. have not been that deepened and extended across the continent. So I, I would say that. Um, those three things. We, we don't. We don't. For instance, talk about the first one. Hmm. Um, it's not that easy to go from point A to point B in Africa. I mean, 30 years ago it was it was very tough. Hmm. Today it's a lot easier, but it's not as easy as one would want to go from one part of the continent to the other. Hmm. That's one. Secondly, it's not that easy for our goods to go across our border, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's amazing how much trade we could do within our sub-region, West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa, and North Africa, mm. um, which, which we don't do. Um, we, we carry on a bit of trade 
uh, quite a bit of trade within our sub-region, but across our sub-region, from Nigeria to South Africa, mm-hmm. um, from East Africa to Northern Africa, from Central Africa into West Africa. It's, 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 it's not the way it should be, given the kind of numbers and our productive abilities or our capacity with, with, within the continent. We don't have um, clear-cut understanding about our currency. All right, mm. and, and 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 the ability to exchange. You'd be surpri- I mean, you wouldn't be surprised. I, I was going to, but I don't think you'd be surprised that it's easier for me to take dollars from here to South Africa than to take naira to want to bring rand mm. into in, in, into Nigeria. Mm. Um, because of West Africa, the ex- means of exchange between naira and safer, mm. all right, uh, or between um, naira and Kenyan shillings. Mm-hmm. Um, the dollar is still the means, the common means of trade within our continent mm-hmm. um, or, or financial exchange. So that's that, that's one thing. Another is, is, the, is the fact that we were all we came to our different understandings about the AFCTA at different times, and I, I think there has been some damage caused by the fact that Nigeria was slow to accede to the treaty uh, at the time that most of the rest of the continent um, did. We we're, were slow to come to come to the table. Mm. We are coming to the table now, but I, I, I wonder how much damage that has done in terms of perception um, in the minds of not just people within Africa, but also outside Africa. Mm. So there, there are these uh, issues. I think it's, it's ultimately going to be a good thing, okay. but we are going to have to come to that table of free trade amongst each other um, in a way that is organized and institutional. All so right. we need to build our institutions here in Africa mm-hmm. that will promote that. I think that there's a lot to do for the African Development Bank, the African Export Import Bank, mm-hmm. the African mm-hmm. Union itself, um, to, to actually deepen our understanding and the means by which we can actually make that treaty work for our various countries. All right. So, that hasn't, hasn't even started so, so, so Professor Yenka, the whole point of the AFCFTA is to reduce trade barriers between African nations. It hopes to remove 90% of tariffs on goods and services, and it also wants to remove other non-tariff barriers. And Nigeria yeah. is a signatory, but right now we have a closed border. And before closing the border, the government stopped making forex available for certain imports from our neighbors, like rice. So is Nigeria in the spirit of the AFCFTA, and is this a good or bad thing? Uh, yeah, thank you, son. I, I, <laughs> no, so uh, I believe uh, the government is sincere. The, the government signed up, up, up to AFCTA. Okay. Uh, I believe the border closure is a temporary measure. Sometimes you you use these kinds of tool as a bluff. Uh, but then I suppose that during that period you want to negotiate uh, properly, you know, so that you can trade transparently and fairly. Uh, one can sometimes understand why this kind of reaction could take place, uh, you know, because I think Nigerian government have been frustrated with uh, what happened at the between us and Benin and all that, uh, where a country so small doesn't eat uh, imported rabbits, you know. So but <laughs> I think we should, we should uh, what I would suggest is that we should use this period. We cannot close our border indefinitely, and I know government is not planning that. I, I understand uh, the, the current closure will end in the uh, end of January. Uh, what I would expect is that in this period, we, we really uh, fight now the right uh, procedure. There was a committee, uh, a joint committee of Niger, Nigeria, Benin, and I don't know any other country that actually have negotiated on this. I hope uh, what they come up with will suffice to to ensure that we, we trade fairly among us. But to the bigger picture, mm. I support very strongly that we should integrate Africa, 55 countries, $3.3 trillion zone, I think it's uh, for us. Uh, it it will be an anomaly if we don't trade among each other. It's it's difficult because of the historical colonial boundaries that had separated us. Mm. Uh, but this is history. Uh, it's evolution. Uh, Europe did it. If you know a bit of history of Europe, also, mm. you know, in the 17th century, they were fighting crazy among themselves. They were mm. all small, small states, uh, vassals, and all that. And eventually, they integrated. So I think that's a huge. To be learned, and we don't want to wait. We don't have to wait 100 years to do it. Mm. Uh, right now, you know, a, a, a key issues. For example, you talked about tariffs. Yes, the tariffs are very important. Uh, according to studies from the bank here where I work at the African Development Bank, mm. uh, 
there are some figures that say that, for example, if you um, uh, remove the ninety percent tariff that was that was suggested from the from the statute, mm -hmm. you take about four point something billion dollars from you know from some country. But the welfare gain is much higher, about four or five times. Mm. So overall, I think it's a, it's a big, big gain. People estimate between sixteen to twenty billion dollars will come back to welfare gain in terms of uh, manufacturing capabilities being built up. And this is the second point I need to make. Why are we doing that? And this is one of the issues I, I, we have been promoting and I'm championing within the bank and across Africa. We are working in 15 countries now. Uh, and I'm driving this process where we are building special agro industrial zones, mm. including Nigeria, mm -hmm. uh, to process what is our comparative advantage, which is uh, agro-business. Uh, ag uh, I, I hesitate always to say agriculture because once you say agriculture in Africa, people begin to think of of oh, and cutlass and all that. <laughs> uh, agri yes, agri business today, Sandra, in twenty thirty, the estimate is that it will be worth one trillion dollars in Africa. Okay, let, let's uh, let, let, let let let's let's hold the conversation here. We need to take a quick break. When we come back, I I want to come back to you, Mister Ebo, and the point you were making earlier about tariffs because we cannot have a a power sector expert on the show and not talk about tariffs and not talk about the problems, especially that the Jenkos and the Discos are facing. And you also said something that uh, I found quite interesting. You said that there there were uh, people who were sabotaging in Nigeria's road uh, to electricity uh, sufficiency, if I can say that. I don't know if that's a thing, but I guess I'm just making it a thing now. Uh, Mr. Ekbo, uh, Professor Yeyenka, please stay with us. You as well who's listening, leave us comments on Facebook and YouTube where we're streaming this conversation live. Nigeria Info 99.3. I'm Sandra Ezekwasili. 99.3 Nigeria Info.
This is Hard Facts. Hello, Lagos. You're listening to Sandra Ezekwesili on Hard Facts. And uh, I have on the show with me uh, uh, Professor Banjo Yeleron Oyeyinka, who wrote a book about industrialization from consumption to production, the whys and ways out of a failed industrialization in Nigeria. I also have a legal practitioner, an energy specialist, and a public administrator who was um, at the Bureau for Public uh, Enterprise. He was also uh, at uh, the past sector as a member of the team, the past sector reform team, and he also worked as a commissioner on the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. Eyo Ewo is here. And today we're having conversations about industrialization in Africa because Africa Industrialization Day is today. We're looking at Nigeria's path to industrialization. And Eyo, I want to come back to the point about tariffs. Anytime I have power experts on the show, they tell me that one of the biggest problems in the sector is that the tariffs are too low for the Jenkos and the discos to operate profitably. You said that's not quite the case, Ayo. Okay, so, yes. Um, I, I, tariffs are an issue, and I think that they have been blown out of all proportion, particularly by the distribution companies, okay. which almost universally, without exception, do not operate in an efficient manner. So while indeed it is true that tariffs are not set at the right levels, and, mm. I, and I, I want to avoid here um, high, low, and their emotive connotations, okay. the reality is that a, kil- a unit of electricity is like a loaf of bread. Okay. All right? It is the product of a manufacturing process. You take natural gas, which you buy, and burn it, all right, okay. in a turbine, um, in a generator, and spin a turbine. And that turbine produces electrical energy, which must be carried a wire to somebody's house. All these things are processes that require maintenance, okay. and therefore a cost, all right? Okay. So think about the lady that sells Amala and the widow down the road. Mm. If she does not get enough money, from selling that plus a profit to mm. cover the cost of buying more to come back the next day, she will never be in business. Mm. It's the same thing with the electricity sector. Mm. But it's a little bit more complicated when you don't go go beyond that from the issue of tariffs. If I pay one naira for a unit of electricity to a monopoly distributor, mm. I don't have a choice because of the nature of the electricity business. Mm. The demand is on that distribution company to operate as efficiently as it can. And this is the other side of the coin that we tend to forget, that those who are complaining about tariffs tend to forget. Our distribution companies have not done enough. Also, I would say over the last six years since they were privatized, to actually show to the populace and change the perception, the mind of the populace, that they are not operating the way they should operate. So yes, tariffs need to be set right. And we need to move away from this patriarchal system that we have in Nigeria where the public sector, the government, thinks that electricity is something that should be given to people. Mm. If you go to, and, and, and this is not an academic thing for me, um, all of us know people who live in estates that pay, quote, a higher, and here I will use that word, mm-hmm. a higher rate than most of us pay. Mm-hmm. But in those places when you go there, the light doesn't blink. Mm-hmm. Power doesn't power supply is constant. It is steady. Mm-hmm. It is qualitative. It is always there mm-hmm. because they pay for it. The same thing across the country. If we have to use electricity for what the professor has talked about, mm-hmm. industrialization, mm-hmm. we have to have it in adequate quantities. If we're going to have it in adequate quantities, we have to pay for it because, like everything else, is the is the it's, it's an end product. So for me, the economics are quite simple, but they are not the only issue. As, as someone who has been um, right there in the thick of things as, mm. as, as a regulator, mm-hmm. I know that there has to be on the other side um, a change in the way our distribution companies are run, mm. a, change, a, a change in the way the owners, or the managers rather, not the owners, because the owners are both the federal government and the private sector, mm-hmm. but the private sector has management control of these companies. Mm-hmm. And in almost every instance, the private sector has used these distribution companies um, in a way that is, was unexpected and, quite frankly, is unwarranted. 
So we, we need to have the, the nature of the regulation of this distribution company change and to force them to be a little bit more efficient, mm. even as we are giving them the right tariffs. Because in return for those tariffs, there has to be efficient operation. Okay. Um, so I, I would I, I I tend not to want to say too much because it's easy to, to, to become technical. But <laughs> really, the truth of the matter is that the right kind of tariffs, setting the tariffs at the right levels, also requires that on the other hand. Our discos operate in the right way. Are there and penalties the discos, for when they don't operate in the right way? Oh yes, there are. There are. But, are they implemented? You know, um, that's the thing. I was just going to say that um, <laughs> the nature of, of regulation has been rather lax, okay. if I may say so. Okay. Um, and you, you, you could have good and bad reasons for for this, but I would say on the whole, um, our distribution companies have been left to think that we all are beholden to them. And, and, and that kind of thinking, I would say, needs to change. Okay, let's take a step back and talk about workforce. Uh, Professor Yenka, industrial work is becoming increasingly complex, right? Um, we've seen, for instance, rice from Benin Republic out competing Nigerian rice. Yes, we can say, oh, they're not making it there. The rice is coming out from, the, from other countries but, and all of that. But we've seen rice from Benin Republic out competing Nigerian rice. Do you think that skilled workforce from African countries like Rwanda, Ethiopia, Botswana, Kenya, South Africa, and Egypt outcompete Nigerian workers because all the time whenever these conversations come up we have analysts who say that Nigeria doesn't have a workforce that is educated enough to be competitive skilled industrial workers so do you think that skilled workforce from other African countries like Rwanda Ethiopia Botswana Kenya South Africa Egypt will outcompete Nigerian workers Professor Yenka You know, you build up uh, skills by brands. You and you cannot compare oranges and apples. You can build up skills in certain sectors. Um, you know, but it's very difficult. Of course, there are what you call vertical in disintegration, where you have certain skills when you acquire it. For example, in machine molding or machine drawing, which can apply to all sectors. Uh, Apart from South Africa, uh, practically almost all these countries you have mentioned they don't have any industrial base that is what really, uh, you know, uh, competing with. I mean, I'm not saying this to denigrate any country. Uh, we're almost all in the same port. You look at the GDP contribution by manufacturing in almost all of these countries. Mm. Uh, they are pretty low. Uh, so... I am not sure, I don't have the data to, to, to prove that, but what you see is that when you you take a Nigerian who works in a, you know, an auto company in Europe somewhere, mm. he suddenly begins to excel. Why? Because he practices. It's called learning by doing. Mm. You know, you you only hone your skills when you repeatedly do something and you get to become a specialist. So, I, I, I'm not sure about this particular debate, uh, but I, I am a proponent of those who will promote, um, like I said, to integrate Africa. Mm. Uh, but in doing that, we need to build up our industri industrial production capacity mm. so that we don't end up trading uh, goods that are imported from elsewhere. I really want to see an African uh, industrial base, a really genuine African industrial base. We had a lot of discussions in Addis Ababa in the last two, three days, you know, on the auto industry, on the advanced modern agricultural industry, mm. on all of that. And by concerted effort, I believe we can really... I mean, look at what... Who, who, I mean, serious, look, look around in Nigeria, you know, where we are coming from. You know, look around and see which industries are really thriving that you can genuine empirical comparison. You know, I was a researcher in, at the Nigerian Institute of Social and Economic Research for many years, between 1988 and 1997. And we used to do all manner of empirical work all over the country, comparing skills at the level of manufacturing in the east, west, north, and so forth. Uh, now I'm not sure 
I'm not sure uh, who, who is comparing what now. So this is this is my difficulty with answering this particular question. <laughs> But you know, the, I think where you are.